next example that we're going to look at for circular motion is this idea of going around a bank curve. Now you might not have ever noticed it, but whenever you turn a corner in a road, the road is banked. Now it might be very slight, it might be a very, very small angle. Um, but it's in there so that the forces work to make you um, turn the corner easier. Where it's really noticeable, okay, coming down Victoria Road towards Parramatta. Okay, so you're heading towards Parramatta, and you know that loop that you go, because now I'm going to go up James Roos Drive. You know the one I mean? As you go around, have you ever felt yourself going, and you feel like you're being pushed against the door and that? Okay, so that's a very steep one. That's a steep bank curve. Uh, another very, very steep bank curve, have you ever watched the cycling? Those velodromes, they're very steep bank curves. Okay. So let's have a look at the forces in play in a bank curve. So here's the cross section of our vehicle, whatever it happens to be, Bob, on the bank curve. So our curve, there's the banking, you make some sort of angle with the, the horizontal. So let's actually put Bob in there. There he is. Okay. Two forces acting on Bob. We've still got the force due to gravity. But remember we talked about, was it yesterday we introduced the idea? Whenever you're in contact with a surface, there'll be a normal force or a reaction force at right angles to the surface. And they're really the only forces that are in play here. Okay. Well, horizontally, we're moving in a circle. So horizontal forces is mv squared on r. There's good old Bob. Well, we're going to need components of the normal. So using a bit of geometry, I work out where theta is. And theta will end up being in that position there. So horizontally, that'll be opposite. So n sine theta. So n sine theta will be mv squared on r. Vertical forces. Well, hopefully, we're not moving up or down. We, we want to just go around the corner nicely. So hopefully there's no vertical movement there. So n cos theta going up, mg going down, n cos theta equals mg. Hmm. What do you notice? n is like t, except it's n. Basically, it's exactly the same as the conical pendulum yesterday. But the tension has been replaced with the normal force. But other than that, the, uh, the situation is exactly the same. So we can do the same sorts of things. We can say, oh, well, uh, tan theta, let's eliminate the uh, tension. Well, not tension this time. Eliminate the normal force. And we get tan theta. And there's V squared on RG. So let's, let's have a look at this one. Now, I don't know whether you knew this or not, but train drivers need to know extension to your mouse. Oh, yes. No, no, yeah, they do. They sit in their little cabin. You know how it's locked? You can't get into their little cabin? That's because they're doing their maths and they don't want to be disturbed, okay? Because they've got a corner coming up. And now on this railway line, um, so the train driver's coming up, and he goes, okay, the curve, radius 400 metres. Now, I know the distance between the train track, the rails of my train track is uh, one and a half metres, and I also know the banking, this corner we're about to come up, is, uh, well, it's 0 0.08 metres. And so I've got to work out what speed I'm going to take this corner. Because, of course, it's, it's very important that the train gets the right speed. Because unlike a car on a road which can slip if they get it wrong. A train can't. Because if a train gets it wrong, then it's going to have some sideways movement and it'll derail. It won't fly off. But, uh, yeah, the train derails. Okay. So here's our diagram. Now, we said that the uh, tracks were 1.5 metres, so that'll be along the bank, 1.5 metres there. And that rail is 0 0.08 metres above the inside rail there. Okay, let's put our forces in. We have our normal force and we have our force due to gravity. So once again, we'll start off the same way, resolving our forces. So I need to know where theta is for the normal force. Okay, horizontal forces, mv squared on r, circular motion. Good old Bob. N sine theta will be mv squared on r. Vertical forces. We don't want to derail our train. It's going to equal zero. So vertical force, n cos theta, mg. Okay, we're back to those two equations again. 
We're trying to work out how fast we can go around without derailing. So I'll come up with this tan theta, because I can work out tan theta. Do you remember they gave me dimensions for what, well, we could call the hypotenuse and the opposite side. So we know sine theta is 4 on 75. Now, some people do a little cheat here and use what's called the small angle theorem. For small angles, right, sine theta, tan theta, they're going to be the same. But basically we say sine theta, sine theta. So, but I don't do that because I think that's cheating. Sine theta... I can work out tan theta with a little bit of Pythagoras and work out exactly what it is. So, all right, let's work out this velocity, then sub in. Velocity squared over 400 times 9.8. So, V squared, well, that's going to be in metres per second. Train driver, his little speedo's in kilometres per hour. Okay, 52 kilometres. So, he's done his maths. He ignored the people banging on the door. Corner coming up. Come on, corner coming up. It's all right, I've almost got it. I've almost got it. And you go, ah, 52, right? Uh, takes the corner at 52 kilometres per hour and the train doesn't derail and all the passengers are very happy. You see? See? All right. Let's have a look at this little problem. Particle mass M moving constant speed, circular track, radius R, centre C, Banking, so it's a standard sort of one, but they have added in something else because in reality there is another force there, and that is friction. It's a resistive force. Because remember, we're going around in the circle, but if I speed up, I'm going to want to move up. Remember our helicopter? When we sped up, it moved up. Well, this is the same sort of motion. So if we speed up, then we're going to go up the bank. Slow down, we'll go down the bank. So as soon as we're moving up or down the bank, there's going to be resistance in the opposite direction, friction. This problem takes friction into account. Now, whether it's up the bank or down the bank depends, obviously, on whether we're speeding up or slowing down. And if we're speeding up, then friction will go which way? You've got a 50-50 chance here. Yeah, it's got to go down the bank, because if we speed up, we're going to move up the bank. Friction will be in the opposite direction. It'll go down the bank. But if we're slowing down, it'll be like this diagram has, where friction will go up the bank. And that's why they're saying it, it's either going to be minus mu n or mu n, depending on whether we're speeding up or slowing down. Mu is a positive constant, n is a com normal component, because friction always turns out to be um, some constant times the, the normal force. The sine of f is positive when f is directed up the bank. Okay. So acceleration due to gravity is g. Acceleration due to circular motion, v squared on r. That was nice of them to tell us that. Oh, well, thank you. We should know that anyway, though, of course. And is directed towards the centre of the track. They even told us that bit as well. Ha. By resolving forces horizontally and vertically, look at this beautiful expression that we're going to go and show. Here's the diagram. So basically, we've just got to resolve our forces horizontally and vertically. Well, the normal force and the frictional force, neither of them are vertical or horizontal. So we're going to have to work out the components. There we go. So we'll work out where theta is. Well, for the normal force, theta once again is in that position there. But by a bit of geometry, that means next to it there must be 90 minus theta. So for the frictional force, theta will be up the top in that triangle there. So horizontally, it's mv squared on r. Horizontally, we have component of the normal force going to the left, frictional force going to the right. And they will equal mv squared on r. Okay. Vertical forces, again, that's going to be zero. Let's draw all the forces there. Component of normal going up. Component of friction, that also is going up. Uh, gravity is still going down. They'll all sum to be zero. Okay. N cos plus F sine, good. N sine minus F cos, we can now create this fraction that they're looking for. 
Now, I don't know why I did it this really long way. In hindsight, I now remember I did it a really <laughs> stupid way because I should have noticed, and I think when I did this problem, I didn't actually notice that, hey, look, that's the same as the denominator. Hey, look, that's the same as the numerator. So I could have just gone mv squared on r divided by mg and got the answer out really quickly. Instead, what I did is I went, oh, I know the answer is going to be v squared on rg. How can I create that? So I said, oh, that's going to be mv squared on r times 1 on mg, which is that. So I sort of did it backwards. But anyway, I still got the answer. Probably more sensible to do it the other way, I think. If you notice, which clearly you should notice, I don't know why I didn't. One of those days, I suppose. All right. Show that the maximum speed, which cleverly we'll call V max, at which the particle can travel without slipping up the track, is given by that expression there. Oh, and by the way, you can suppose that mu tan theta is less than one. Friction is the resistive force. This is the one, the fastest we can go without slipping up the track. So now friction is working down the track. They said friction positive was up the track. So therefore, friction for this one is going down the track. So it's minus mu n for friction in this. So let's sub it into our, uh, our formula that we got. What we got? There's v squared max. That's what we're trying to work out, isn't it? Yes. Okay. N sine theta plus mu n cos theta will be sine theta on cos theta plus mu cos theta on cos theta over cos theta on cos theta minus mu sine theta on cos theta. How on earth did I just do that? The ends obviously cancel. Yes? And then all I did was divide everything by cos theta. That's all I've done. Just cos. Because look at what I want to get. I ended up with tan thetas. Tan is, of course, sine on cos. So once I do that, I get tan theta plus mu on 1 minus mu tan theta. Okay. If mu is greater than or equal to tan theta, then the particle will not slide down the track regardless of its speed. Okay. V minimum is the minimum speed. Okay. Show that if mu is greater than or equal to tan theta, then the particle will not slide down the track regardless of the speed. Okay. Can't happen. So now, because we're investigating sliding down the track, friction is acting up the track. So it would now be positive mu n that I'll substitute in for f instead of negative mu n. So v squared minimum, basically it's going to be the same thing, but the sign has changed where I had the mu n. So it's now going to be 10 theta minus mu on 1 plus mu 10 theta. Okay. But mu is greater than or equal to tan theta. Well, that means v squared minimum is less than or equal to zero. Because if mu is greater than or equal to tan theta, on the top of this fraction, I'm saying tan theta minus something that's bigger than tan theta. Must get a negative number. Hang on. v squared being negative can't happen. So this situation can never happen. The minimum speed, if you like, is zero. Well, if it's zero, I'm not moving. So it can't happen. There is no minimum velocity that we can travel without sliding down the track. You're just not going to slide down the track. I can't get a velocity. I can't get an answer to this question. Okay. Let's have a look at this interesting problem from I mean, it's an old problem now, oh, 20 years, but it is quite a good one. So what we've got is we've got a, a drum, I don't know, one of those big drums that they put oil in or something, whatever. And uh, we're going to rotate around. But inside this drum, 
is, well, let's imagine it's a, it's a ball bearing or something like that. So the ball bearing is on the surface of the drum inside. So as we spin the drum, the ball bearing stays around the surface. So that's basically what we've got. Circular drum rotating, um, without, and there's, there's a particle P, ball bearing, Bob, is rotating in a vertical circle. So rather than a horizontal circle, we've now got a vertical circle. Radius of the drum is r meters, angular velocity, omega, so standard sort of things, gravity is g, mass is m, centre of the drum, o. So now they've told us op makes an angle of theta with the horizontal at the particular point we're investigating. The drum, therefore, will exert a normal force on the ball bearing because the ball bearing is in contact with the drum. Anytime you make contact then you uh, have a normal force at right angles. Now, because it's at right angles, that means it's also going towards the centre of the circle. Remember, the radius is perpendicular to the tangent. So there's the normal force. Uh, but there's also a frictional force, because if the ball bearing is rotating on the drum, then there must be friction in the opposite direction, and that one will be in the order of the tangent in that direction because it will be perpendicular to the normal force. Okay. Resolving force is perpendicular to and parallel to OP. Find an expression for F on N. So this time you'll notice they haven't said horizontal and vertical because the drum's rotating. So what they said is we're going to investigate just simply parallel and perpendicular to OP. So what I did is I turned it so it is horizontal and vertical because then that just makes life easier to imagine because we're used to using horizontal. But what that now means is gravity is no longer a vertical force in my problem. Gravity is now at an angle. So we're going to have a component of gravity in both the horizontal, well, what looks like horizontal and what looks like the vertical direction. So let's draw those components in. A little bit of geometry, we can work out theta is in that position there. So the forces perpendicular to OP is going to be zero. Right, we're moving in a vertical circle, so it's circular motion. So that's going to be directed towards the centre, which conveniently in our diagram, of course, is purely downwards now. So forces perpendicular, zero. Nothing's happening there. Let's draw in Bob. There he is. So what do we got? There is friction. It's totally a, what appears to be a horizontal force. Mg cos theta will be the component of gravity. So Mg cos theta minus friction will equal zero. That allows me to work out friction. Okay. Perpendicular. Well, they were summed to be, because it's towards the centre, and that's our centripetal force, is the resultant force towards the centre. It'll be mr omega squared. And having a look at that one, we have the normal force is purely what appears to be vertical, and uh, a component of gravity, mg sine theta. So n plus mg sine theta is mr omega squared. Now, what was it we were trying to show? Was it f on n or something like that? Was it? Um, oh, I've just made N the subject there. So I can now do F on N, substituting in mg cos theta on mr omega squared minus mg sine theta. The mass cancels in everything, and I, I get an expression for F on N. g cos theta on r omega squared minus g sine theta. So that was a very different sort of a question there, because most of the questions, as I say, just involve a... Um, that's horizontal. I was trying to think of the word. The, the horizontal circle, but they changed it up a bit here and said, oh, let's, let's have a look at this vertical one. Which brings up an interesting idea, rotating the problem. Because what you'll notice with this one, by doing it this way, if I wanted to calculate the friction, I've got a formula for friction straight away. Because friction became what appeared to be purely horizontal. And the normal force appeared to be purely vertical. So I can go back to my bank curve problem 
And it gives me an alternative way of looking at that. So there it was our along the bank, put in the forces. We have the normal force. We have MG. I'll say friction's going down for the sake of this, but remember it could be going up, down, depending on what our motion's doing. I could do the same sort of idea. I could rotate this so friction is purely horizontal and the normal force is purely vertical. But it means we'll end up with a component of gravity. There we go, pop in theta there. So I can use the same idea. However, the resultant force in this one now, so unlike that last question where the resultant force conveniently worked out to be vertical because it was going towards the center, my resultant force, <coughs> sorry, in the original one, there it is, horizontal. So if I've re rotated, the resultant force is now at an angle. So I will have a component of the resultant force, what appears to be horizontal, what appears to be vertical. So forces, what appears to be horizontal or along the bank, that will take the horizontal component of the resultant force. So that'll be mv squared on r cos theta. So good old Bob, we have friction going to the left, we have mg sine theta going to the left as well. And so I get f plus mg sine theta is equal to the, what appears to be horizontal component of the resultant force. And so I can get a, a formula for friction straight away. And for the normal force, if I have a look at what appears to be um, vertical, so perpendicular to the bank, it will have the, that component of the resultant force, mv squared on r sine theta. And normal force is going up, mg cos theta going down. So which way is positive? Just checking. Ah, oh, yes, have a look at my resultant force. Going up is the resultant force. So that's going to be the positive direction. So n is positive, mg cos theta is negative. That'll be mv squared on r sine theta. There's a formula for the normal force. So it's a very quick way of coming up with those formulas. Unfortunately, I've seen in tests where they tie your hands in that they say resolving horizontally and vertically, so you have to go the long way about it and you end up with simultaneous equations you have to solve and, and things like that. But this is a much more efficient way if they don't restrict you on how to do it. Rotate the problem, bang, I can get a, a formula for friction or the normal force straight away. Okay. Time to play.